it's just, and I thought of you because you've, you've written so much about the Stones. You have a great love of the Stones. And, um, I mean, what, what, did, what were your first feelings when you heard the news? I was just on the other end of an interview call. I was interviewing a guitar player in, that had played with Leon Russell, and, you know, sort of in the later days. And I was getting all these texts, uh, and I, I was slightly distracted because I hadn't heard the news. It was all happening. And, uh, I mean, I had heard about, you know, I, we had braced ourselves before, and then we had braced ourselves again recently with the news that he wasn't going to be on the road. And, you know, that, that, that usually indicates something quite serious. So, yeah, it was, and I had to break the news to this guitar player who's obviously a fan as well. So, um, it's kind of like, you know, it's, I, I try to avoid the cliches, but it really is like somebody's stepping, let's say, that's one way to avoid it, like, instead of punching me in the gut, it's more somebody stepping on my stomach, you know, like this weight of, like, dread of, like, it's just immortality, where, you know, the guy yeah. led an amazing life, I mean, who the hell thought Keith would be out lasting everybody, but uh, that's the other cliche, but it's true, yeah. <laughs> it's just like, we're all getting up there, man, I'm 55, I, you know, I'm no spring chicken, but it's like, you, you, it's, you just know that this stuff is coming, but when it comes, it's just, it hits you really hard. It's all, yeah, and that's, I think, that's maybe why I'm feeling that way because for so my whole life, you know, I've heard their music and I've loved them so much. And this is, this is like a, a serious reminder that it, there is, there is a final destination here. There is an end. And yeah. And there's something know. about in particular rock stars, right? I mean, we, we're, we're the generation that you and me, that, that, that we're the first generation where it grew up, uh, with rock music as a given, rock and roll mm -hmm. predates us. And for you and I, big music fans, it was about going back and finding, uh, you know, like, I think the first record of the Stones I remember buying contemporaneously may have been uh, Some Girls. But anyway, what I was going to say is that there's something about rock stars that were the ones that lasted because. So many of them were dying young at 27, seemingly. And so the, for the ones that lasted, I mean, the Stones were like the most emblematic survivors hmm. uh, uh, of, of all of this. And so for them to make it, and then, and then for artists, I mean, I think artists, we, not just the celebrity, not just the rock star, but artists, you, you feel that somehow maybe unconsciously you feel like maybe these somehow transcend the normal mortal coil. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. There's some magic there, don't. right? There's a magic that's involved. And, and, uh, and so for someone like that, like Charlie Watts or, or, or David Bowie or Prince, you know, people who I think are actually were aliens who are actually called back to their planet. You know, they were so, it just, for some reason hurts more. I, maybe it's the emotion, yeah, it's the emotional attachment to the music. Maybe you can't, you can't think of somebody at that level of rock star elites that that was less of a rock star and more anti-rock star in yeah. a lot of ways than, than charlie this elegant uh unassuming uh i mean he had no time for all the bull uh, right. of it all so um you know but there's something still about his being up there and in his unassumption in his elegance in his anti-rock stardom he it made him that much more lovable you know yeah, because I think there was the contrast between he was the anti Mick and the anti Keith. So it was I think it was the contrast. So Mick was doing his thing and being the international playboy and you know hanging out with the elite, and Keith was the you know the junky rock god and and anti establishment. But then you you have Charlie who was I mean was, for a, for a guy like me who who I'm just going off on what yeah. you're saying. I mean for me to be in a rock band all these years. Uh, you know, looking like I do, uh, and having met my wife before I left college, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. before I ever went out on my first rock and roll tour, to look at him uh, going home to his family life whenever he could, the same uh, wife for all those years since they were kids. Uh, it, it's it's an other example of you don't have to you know go down the Axl Rose <laughs> right yeah <laughs> slot to be yeah. the Izzy Stratton. You don't have to imitate Keith Richards. You can imitate Charlie Watts, and 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 you know instead, yeah. it's sort of like the other example. I I, I think I, I loved him. I, I don't know if uh, he didn't fall for it. He didn't buy all the BS that came with being in the biggest rock band in the world. 
you know, beyond it, not buying it, he was he he seemed terminally uh, bemused by it. You know, yes. like his <laughs> his wide frog mouth just sort of always in a you know, like let the boys be the boys. I can't believe this is still going on. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Because he he was. I just think he was. Uh, there was a zen to him somehow. Because he was a he's he was a jazz guy, but correct. And then you know he joined up. He always referred to it as you know this is my job. It's like oh I gotta I gotta show up and play for a stadium full of people. You know that's my job. <laughs> you know it's yeah. like and it's like you know Mick and Keith are out there and they're doing their thing and he's just back there. He's like he's like what a drummer should be and i'm not talking about his playing it was kind of like that was his whole being because he was the most consistent in the band yeah just by who he was and you want that in a drummer right as someone who's in a bit who's in a band you want your drummer to be consistent you want them to keep time you want them to be the anchor you yeah know what I mean? uh, but it, it 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 extends from his personality and groundedness to his playing which was uh grounded as well and yeah. unflashy i just remember being a kid you know uh, in the Neil Peart days, and this is nothing to take away from Neil Peart, but just, you know, in the 70s, as the late 70s sort of became ridiculous um, with with drumming and, and, and guitar playing, for that matter, it's like I was sort of made fun of by some of these other musician kids that were like, oh, geez, the Stones, I mean, you know, these guys can't play, and I'm like, well, <laughs> what are we talking about, yeah. you know? I mean... Just because he doesn't have a 40-minute drum solo where the band leaves the stage and, and goes back to the groupies and then comes back out and he's still playing, you know. It's like, you know, I love John Bonham. I love uh, some flashy drummers. I, I, I just, it's just, I, I, was, I was glad as I got older to see people around me mature enough to understand that there is a pocket there, man. Listen to that. Listen to Al Jackson Jr. Listen to Roger Hawkins. Listen mm-hmm. to these guys from 1965 mm-hmm. uh, laying down this sort of solid thing. And that's the school that Charlie came from. It's the less is more. Yeah. And it's not easy. People, you know, the people talk about Charlie and they talk about Ringo Starr the same way. Like, uh, they're not drummers. They don't do anything. Yeah, they don't do anything because (laughs) they're keeping time perfectly. And people don't understand. And I'm not a drummer, but, you know, I've been in bands and I know drummers and and it's like, it's, it's one of the hardest things to do is maintain perfect meter for uh, you know let's say what three and a half minutes you know try it, that it, it's beyond that it's it's like uh, it's 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 the reason that the drummers are always the most they're the sort of first to go under the microscope in a studio and the, and and those guys it's the it's the moment where they can all wither from that pressure from it. right. it's like if you don't have a good drummer I mean, Keith knew it earliest it's like keith says in his book we had to get this guy we had to get charlie just like the beatles had to get ringo they knew this is the foundation any musician that that has played you know more than amateur uh garage stuff uh all actually even those guys you know that it comes down to the drummer first it's Mm -hmm. like you're rushing you're all over the place but if you if you can find a guy that not only keeps time but knows how to play within that time to swing right find that groove. Uh, I mean, there's no band that, that had more of that understanding of what a groove is than the Stones. Right. Now, you mentioned, you know, Keith saying we have to get this drummer. And I, I, I don't know if it was in his book or, or maybe I've read a bunch of books, including yours. I'm not sure. He said something to the effect of if there's no Rolling Stones without Charlie Watts. Yeah. Basically. And I know yeah, they, they were going to go out on the road with Steve Jordan, who's a great drummer. Um, but. So what is what do you think this means as someone who knows a lot about the band? You've written books on them. What do you think this means for Mick and Keith at this point? Yeah, I, I, I don't. You know, people think they're they, people say ridiculous things like they're still in it for the money or whatever. It's like, yeah, <laughs> these guys. There's like they've paid for like you know a hundred generations of their family. This is, this is not about the money. It's about uh, it's about who they are and passion, their vocation. It's 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 part of who they are. They can't, you know, it's part of what's kept them alive all these years is this, this love of music. It's certainly what kept them uh, on the younger side for their, for their age in, in many ways. Um, you know, these guys are my dad's age, and um, uh, it's hard for me to, to, to say that, to believe that sometimes. So what are they going to do? I don't really begrudge them one way or the other. I mean, i got to say, when, I was, when, when Bill Wyman left the band, and I write about this in my books. I, I, I just, I didn't, I didn't think 
I, I, was, I guess what I'm saying is I was really surprised at what a big musical difference it made. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in hindsight, I shouldn't have been surprised because you can't, you can't break up the greatest rhythm section, let's say the greatest extant rhythm section at that point, uh, because there's been some amazing ones all through, throughout history, especially those soul guys and the mm-hmm. wrecking crew guys, whatever yeah. else. But let's, 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 stay, let's stick with like the groups, you know, the, the Funk Brothers at Motown, the Muscle Shoals Swampers, mm-hmm. the Beatles and Stones, uh, the, the Book of T and the MGs guys at Stax. I mean, the, these are, there's, there's so few of them that you could re- literally count them on one hand. And so when Bill left the group, uh, a fantastic bass player took his place. But it's, it's ju- and I, I don't mean it's just not the same, like, oh, it's just not the same, Bill's not up there. I mean, it's literally not the same. It's right. that, that push and pull, that, 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 that swing that Bill somehow found in between Keith and Charlie, that was, there was something, not magical, because that's an overused word, it's just experience, it's, it's generation, it's like t- decades of experience of playing together, and it's chemistry, and yeah. there's something very real about that. There's, when you get into somebody else's rhythm, uh, I, I listen, I know this firsthand. It's like you can go play with other people, and it's, but you come back to that home band, and, man, it just feels like that old comfortable shoe, because it is. It's like you've, you guys know you've grown up together, and it's like finishing your wife's sentences or, or vice versa. There's a, there's a certain familiarity up to it that is perfect for what a band is, and there's so few bands that last. So I don't know. I, I just don't think that, it'll, you know, I just can't imagine the band with another drummer. I just literally can't. It's, it's like, you know, you can't change out the essential cog like that and have it be the same. You've written about the Stones. How many books have you written about the Stones? It's been three? Two. Two? Yeah, one, one called Exile on Main Street that's just about Exile on Main right. Street. Right, yeah, that one. And, uh, yeah, and Rocks Off, 50 Rocks. Tracks That Tell. Okay, all right. Um, so of all the research you've done, what is maybe a favorite Charlie story that you came across it may be true or it may be legend that's fine but something that you thought you know that this is like the greatest thing ever oh in terms of stories i mean the famous one that just jumps to my mind immediately is um is uh is, is nick being drunk and this is probably what in the 80s uh when they were really kind of at their lowest ebb personally and uh and uh, and otherwise uh, and they were having like a sort of a summit or whatever. And Nick, Nick was, and then now you have to take this with a grain of salt because this is all from my memory. And I'm, and this is all from filtered through Keith Richards, who tells it in his book, I think. <laughs> yeah. About, um, about Mick Jagger getting a little too drunk and saying something about my drummer. Uh, get, oh, he calls up, he calls up, he calls up Charlie Watts' yeah. hotel room and says, yeah, well, where's my drummer? I want my drummer up here. And, um, and Charlie was in bed. But he, uh, and, and now that, this is where it gets a little apocryphal, I think. Uh, I think he says, you know, he puts on a suit <laughs> or something, gets, gets dressed yes. in his impeccable yes. style, because he was always style horse, comes up to the room, opens the, <laughs> knocks on the door, Mick opens the door and just knocks him flat and says, I'm not your bloody drummer. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Yeah, I, I remember that, that... Um from life from keith's book and he was like yeah like he <laughs> had he he even put cologne on keith said you could smell the cologne he was just yeah, ready sure f- this got added yeah. to. <laughs> right and it was like four thirty in the morning or something which was yeah. just yeah. and like mick now keith you know keith said he punched mick so hard he slid on a table and almost fell out a window into one of the canals <laughs> in amsterdam that may be a keith richards embellishment but you know what getting in your savile row suit and putting on the bow tie and, and shaving and everything, that's something I tend to believe <laughs> I think about. All, I think that's all Keith's embellishment. I think, I, think, I, think, <laughs> I think Charlie probably composed himself, thought about it, <laughs> yeah. walked up to the room dressed. But uh, I, you know, can you picture him actually putting on a suit and cologne and shaving for I this? I, I doubt I, it. But, I don't know. You know I, I don't we, know, Bill. We, <laughs> this is Charlie want to believe it. You know? You know? He, he did everything with class. And professionalism, yeah. you know. So you know, I I don't know. I'd love to. I I'm going to believe that. I'm going to choose to uh, believe. Me too. That. I choose to believe all the good, right. the good myths <laughs> as well. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well. Yeah. Um, let me just leave you. The, let me just leave you with this. I just I just excerpted my book on on my website because this is if you want to hear Charlie Charlie's importance to the band and Charlie with Bill and how they arranged music and what makes them the Stones. 
I, I can think of no better version, no better uh, example than Wild Horses, um, where you uh, listen to Charlie's points of entry and exit of the song. Like most drummers would maybe wait for an intro and then come in, but just the way that Charlie fits himself in there and then drops out and then comes back in. Uh, there's there's some amazing work in there. Very simple, but it builds. Each each little part of the arrangement builds, and Charlie almost arranges that song himself. Uh, I, I really I, I point to that as my example. That's Charlie Watts right there. Exactly. Doing it for the song. Well, wow, that's fantastic. Yep. I, just to add to the, the, the Amsterdam story, I'm sure you've seen the documentary 25 by 5. Yeah, okay. Another good story. <laughs> so the very end of that film, they do the credits and everything, and then they they go to Charlie, and the guy's like, "You've been in the band for a long time," and Charlie says, "Yes, it's very hard work." He goes, "Well, not so much today. We've done absolutely nothing here." And the guy says, "You've probably done a lot of waiting around being in the Rolling Stones for twenty five years." He says, "Yeah, five years of actually playing and twenty years of waiting around." <laughs> Right. That's that's that's, <laughs> that's rock and roll right there, man. That's right, man. That's right. So, <laughs> hey, Bill, thank you so much, man. I appreciate your time and uh, and your insights. And uh, you know, I, I suggest people go and read your books, "Rocks Off," and then the uh, thirty-three and a third series book on Exile on Main Street, which is also excellent and still my favorite album from those guys. So, um, well, I appreciate being thought of for for this. It's an honor for me to, to talk about my musical hero like this, and. Uh, yeah, rest in peace, Charlie. It's, uh, and uh, <clears throat> I'm all choked up thinking about it. But yeah. I mean, I, I really think of Keith and Mick and and, and his family, and uh, you know, it's gonna yeah. it's gonna hit them hard. Yeah, yeah. Well, I appreciate it, Bill. Thanks, Mike.